Hello class and welcome to Module 7, Video 2 for Music Appreciation Online, the 20th century. Most of our remaining 20th century composers are American or naturalized American citizens. We will begin with Charles Ives, perhaps the first avant-garde American composer. Ives was born in Connecticut into a musical family and studied music as a youth. His father, George Ives, was a military bandmaster during the Civil War. He was influenced by the curious things that can happen in a performance, such as two clarinets playing out of tune, or one cornet playing slightly behind the beat. George passed this curiosity down to Charles, who later used these oddities in his own music. Charles eventually studied composition at Yale University, but was too experimental for the traditional professors there. Ives knew that his music was outside the norm and decided to go into the insurance business upon graduation from Yale. He later said, my family would have starved on my dissonances. Ives did very well as an insurance salesman and became a millionaire fairly quickly. This afforded him the luxury of writing his music without fear that no one would buy it or listen to it. Though he was an avant-garde composer, he was inspired by all things American. His music showed the influence of hymns, marches, folk songs, pop tunes, and ragtime. Sometimes he combined several genres and styles together. His music was often polytonal and polyrhythmic. It is best described as controlled chaos. Ives wrote in a variety of genres and is known for his art songs, symphonies, and tone poems. Our example is from one of Ives' best known works, called Three Places in New England. This is a set of three symphonic poems, each describing some aspect of life in New England. This movement is called Putnam's Camp, Reading, Connecticut. There was a wonderful program that Ives wrote to describe this piece. You can see it in the ebook or listening guide background section at the Connect website. Many of you may have heard of George Gershwin. There's no doubt you have probably heard his music. Gershwin was one of the most popular American composers of all time. And though he wrote several great symphonic works, he is best known for his popular songs, many of which appeared in Broadway shows. His brother, Ira Gershwin, was the lyricist for most of these songs. George Gershwin was heavily influenced by the new jazz sound that became America's pop music of the 1920s. His music has elements of jazz harmony and swing, but there is no improvisation inherent in his music. However, Jazz musicians have always been drawn to Gershwin's interesting melodies and Irish clever lyrics, so Gershwin's songs make great vehicles for jazz improvisation. One of Gershwin's best-known works is the opera Porgy and Bess, written in 1935. It was controversial at the time because Gershwin, a white Jewish boy from Manhattan, dared to write a work celebrating the African-American culture of the Gullah community of coastal South Carolina. The piece eventually overcame its racially charged history and is still performed all over the world today. Gershwin's music is all very tonal, but certainly shows influence of modern composers of the day like Claude Debussy and Maurice Ravel, two impressionist composers. You will notice that Gershwin's music often has a jazz type rhythm, which is one reason it has remained popular. It's usually very happy music. Our example is the piano showpiece called Rhapsody in Blue. It was commissioned by Paul Whiteman, a classically trained musician who led one of the most important society dance bands of the 20s and 30s. The Rhapsody is almost like a jazz piano concerto, except there is no improvisation. However, Gershwin was a virtuoso pianist and known to have been a great improviser. Many of the cadenzas in this piece sound impromptu, but they were all completely notated. Gershwin probably improvised them originally, then notated what he played to give it that spontaneous feel. Whiteman had wanted to bridge the gap between popular and classical styles and decided to commission several young composers to write music for a special performance that took place in 1924, right during the heyday of the Jazz Age. Whiteman called this performance an experiment in modern music. He had approached Gershwin about writing a piece for the performance, but Gershwin, who was busy working on a new musical, declined. Later, after consulting with several other musicians, Gershwin realized that this was a rare opportunity and decided to embrace it. He wrote the Rhapsody in Blue in just a couple of weeks. Ferdi Grofe, 
an arranger for Whiteman and a well-known composer in his own right, actually orchestrated the work. It was originally written for Whiteman's smaller dance style orchestra. Years later, it was reorchestrated to accommodate a full symphony orchestra. That is the version you will hear in the recording. Many of you will probably recognize one or more of the distinct themes of this fun piece. Listen at the Connect site. Our next composer is William Grant Still, the first well-known African-American classical composer. He was born in Mississippi but raised in Arkansas where he took up the violin as a child. He eventually went to medical school at Wilberforce University but soon discovered his real passion was music. Still played in several groups at the university and even learned several new instruments. He left Wilberforce to work for W.C. Handy, a cornet player and composer of popular songs, mostly blues. Handy hired Still to orchestrate many of his works, and Handy taught Still about popular music, especially blues. Still made his way back to school and attended the Oberlin College Conservatory of Music near Cleveland. Still worked in New York and was a major part of the Harlem Renaissance, a cultural movement involving African-American artists, writers, and composers, based in the Harlem area of New York City. Later, Still studied with avant-garde French-born composer Edgar Varese. Ultimately, he ended up in Los Angeles, where he wrote music for films, TV, and Broadway musicals. Still was the first black composer to have a work performed by a major symphony orchestra, and he was the first black composer to conduct a major symphony orchestra. Like George Gershwin, Still's music bridges the gap between popular and classical styles. Our example is from Still's best-known work, the Afro-American Symphony, premiered in 1931. We will hear the third movement of the work, which is subtitled Humor. There is definitely a light-hearted spirit to this piece. It is intended to conjure imagery of African-American folk culture and still even includes the tenor banjo in the piece. All four movements were prefaced by lines from An Antebellum Sermon, a poem by African-American poet Paul Lawrence Dunbar, another major figure of the Harlem Renaissance. So this could be considered a program symphony. The line that introduces movement three is, and will shout out hallelujahs on that mighty reckoning day. It was written in dialect. The opening theme still gives us starts with a musical expression of the word hallelujah. Later in the movement still even quotes George Gershwin's song, I've Got Rhythm. The last theme takes advantage of the blues style and uses what we call blue notes. These were certain notes that blues singers would bend downward to create a bluesy sound. The third, fifth, and seventh notes of the major scale are typically flatted now to imitate this sound. Listen for this toward the end of the movement. Read more about this piece on the Connect site, then listen to this delightful work. Aaron Copeland is generally considered to be the quintessential American composer. His work is often very programmatic and gives us imagery of wide open spaces, such as the American West. Copeland grew up in New York City, but always spoke of how he heard little music in his home as a child. His sister helped to expose him to the musical world, and he flourished. He studied in France with the famous composition teacher Nadia Boulanger. Then in his early 20s, he returned to the U.S. determined to write what he thought of as solidly American music. His early works demonstrate the influence of early jazz, though his music is not considered to be jazz or even like the symphonic jazz written by Gershwin. During the 1930s and 40s, Copeland wrote music that was intended to appeal to the common person. He felt that music could be of a high quality and still reach the average Joe. Copeland used a variety of sources for his material, hymns, cowboy songs, folk songs, and dances. His music is often polytonal and very interesting rhythmically, but still accessible to the average ear. Later in his career, Copeland experimented with some of the principles of Schoenberg's method of 12-tone composition. He even wrote a famous clarinet concerto for the jazz icon, Benny Goodman, who was also known for his incredible classical technique. Copeland may be best remembered for his overtures and ballets. One of his earliest ballets was commissioned by the Martha Graham Dance Company of New York. A well-known choreographer, Graham had heard some of Copeland's early work and thought he would be perfect for a project she was working on. Does this sound familiar? It is reminiscent of Stravinsky's early work with the Ballet Russe. Copeland's work is called Appalachian Spring and is meant to evoke the culture of a farm community in the Pennsylvania foothills of Appalachia. 
The piece was originally scored for just 13 instruments, but Copland later reorchestrated the work for full symphony orchestra. During the ballet, different characters of this farm community emerge, a young wedded couple, a preacher and his followers, and others. The scene we will focus on comes from section 7 of the work. It is a theme and variations on simple gifts, a shaker folk melody. The shakers were a religious sect that literally shook when they got the spirit. Some of you might recognize this melody and this work. It has been used in TV and movies and, of course, advertising. You can listen at the Connect website. One of the more interesting composers of the 20th century is Argentinian Alberto Ginastera. Ginastera was strongly influenced by his native music and much of his work features strong rhythmic motives, thick orchestral textures, and quite a few percussion instruments. He wrote a wide variety of works including opera, ballet, solo piano works, concertos, and chamber music. Much of his music is inspired by the tradition of gauchos, the native horsemen of the Argentine plains. One such piece is a ballet he composed in 1941 entitled Estancia Suite. Gina Stera did spend some time in the U.S. and while here he studied with Aaron Copeland. Our example is Malambo, the final dance from the Estancia Suite. The piece originated as a ballet commissioned by the Ballet Caravan of New York. The dance troupe disbanded before the piece could be premiered, but Gina Stera salvaged the work by turning it into an orchestral suite. Of the four movements, Malambo may be the best known. It features a quick compound meter with exciting rhythmic gestures that are intended to portray the traditional dance of the gauchos, who were known for trying to best one another in informal dance competitions. Listen to this exciting piece at the Connect website. After 1945, composers began to diversify with a wide range of musical styles. These are listed for you here. We begin with the expanded use of Schoenberg's 12-tone system. Many composers embraced the method and even expanded the concept to create music that was completely serialized. Number two on the list is serialism. Again, the idea that virtually any parameters of music can be serialized, such as rhythm, dynamics, and even tone color. Another interesting concept is that of chance music. This is sometimes referred to by the Greek name aleatoric music. Alia is the Greek word for game of chance. So in practice, composers would use some element of chance to create any or all of the musical material, perhaps rolling dice, flipping a coin, or even spinning a bottle. Often the chance element was left to the performers as we have with improvised music such as jazz. However, this was not organized as most jazz is. For instance, a composer might give the players a specific rhythm to play but no pitches. The performers would choose the pitches randomly during performance. Our next style is called minimalism, which is characterized by a strong tonality, a steady pulse, and usually repeated melodic fragments or motives. Over time, these motives eventually change little by little until they morph into something different. The changes are minimal, hence the name. Another style emerged in the 20th century that involved composers quoting from other works. As we have learned, this was not a new idea. Composers had been borrowing melodies for hundreds of years. However, with quotation music, the composer often literally quotes sections from the original work. Often composers will borrow from earlier style periods, such as the Baroque. During the second half of the 20th century, many composers grew weary of the abstract sound of atonal music and reverted to the tradition of tonality. Of course, the introduction of electronics into the musical world altered the way we can create and manipulate sound. Music can be created with synthesizers or computers, and early examples of electronic music required the composer to create a fixed recorded piece where sounds had been manipulated with a variety of sound-altering electronics. Liberation of sound is the notion that virtually anything that produces a sound can be used in a musical context. And finally, mixed media is a type of performance art where several media are blended in performance. Films, slideshows, interpretive dance might all be confined in performance and accompanied by live music. One of the best known experimental composers was the American John Cage. 
He is credited with introducing the concept of chance music and once wrote a piece for solo piano called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds, which required a pianist to sit at a piano and literally not play for four minutes and 33 seconds. Cage's intent was not to cheat the audience, though some clearly reacted this way at the premiere. Cage simply wanted the music to be derived from every sound that could emanate from an audience during a performance. A cough, the sound of someone unwrapping a piece of hard candy, the hum of the lights, etc. It is certainly an abstract way to think of music, but it helped to influence a new approach to composing and performing classical music. Cage was also interested in percussive sounds and was one of the first to write for percussion ensemble. He also developed the prepared piano, an acoustic grand piano with various objects placed in between the strings. Screws, bolts, spoons, etc. would be used to change the vibrating properties of the strings. When a key was depressed, unusual percussive sounds would result. Cage's music was often very contrapuntal and rhythmically interesting. Cage wrote several works for his prepared piano, and one of the best known is his Sonatas and Interludes for Prepared Piano, written between 1946 and 1948. The piece is intended to express eight permanent emotions found in the Raza aesthetic theory of Indian tradition. Many of the pieces are in binary form, such as this Sonata No. 2. The structure of each sonata is determined by a sequence of natural numbers and fractions, creating a high level of complexity. Cage also gave specific instructions on how to prepare the piano, including a list of which types of items or the material from which they are made. For instance, Cage specified that 45 specific notes were to be prepared with metal screws or bolts, as seen in the photo here. Other notes were prepared with plastic or rubber. Some notes retain a fairly normal piano-type sound, while others sound percussive. As a matter of fact, Cage developed the prepared piano for a piece he composed for an African-themed dance recital. Apparently, there was no room on stage for a percussion ensemble, which is what Cage had originally intended. So he basically created a percussion ensemble out of the piano. After all, the piano is really a percussion instrument. The overall work is based on the first eight of the Navrasa's nine emotions, which culminate in the ninth of the Navrasa's, which is tranquility. There are four white, humor, wonder, erotic, and heroic, accepting one's experience, in Cage's words, and four black, anger, fear, disgust, and sorrow. As you listen to this, try to imagine which rasa is implied by Sonata II. Cage did not specify. One of the most unique and experimental of all 20th century composers was French-born Edgard Varese. Varese had studied traditional music, but felt his calling was to create new sounds, sounds that could not be produced with traditional instruments or voices. Varese created what he called musique concrète, a French term meaning music in a fixed format. For him, that was tape. Varese recorded all kinds of sounds, from acoustic instruments and voices to jackhammers, alarm clocks, car horns, and just about anything that produced a sound that he liked. He would then take these recorded sounds into his electronics laboratory and tweak them using all manner of oscillators and other sound altering devices. He would then put these sounds together in kind of a collage that would represent a fixed musical work. Varese was also another composer who pioneered the idea of percussion ensemble. One of his best known works, Ionization, was composed for a large group of percussion instruments of various types. It is generally considered to be the first piece to feature only percussion. It is clear that Varez expected the listener to be open-minded and perhaps change their perception of music. Our example is perhaps Varez's most famous work. It is called Poem Electronique, which means, of course, electronic poem in English. The piece was commissioned for the World's Fair of 1958 to be held in Brussels, Belgium. It was written specifically to be broadcast over 425 loudspeakers in the pavilion sponsored by the Philips Radio Corporation. Varese was attempting to provide an experience of sound as it moves through space. In the recording of this piece, you can hear early attempts to use stereo separation, which was a very new concept at the time. The Philips Pavilion also presented artwork, but apparently there was no attempt to connect the art with Varese's piece. Listen to this piece on Connect. 
It is most effective if heard on a system with stereo separation. The final composer of our 20th century classical idiom is Ellen Taft Willick. Originally from Florida, Zwillick studied violin and composition at Florida State University and the Juilliard School. Her music is unique and combines elements of various styles. Zwillick is the first woman to win a Pulitzer Award for music. She is still active today and is one of the most commissioned composers in the world. For our example, we will hear the first movement of Concerto Grosso, composed in 1985 to commemorate the 300th anniversary of the birth of Baroque master George Frederick Handel. The piece is considered to be an example of quotation music, since Zwillick actually quotes a piece by Handel. The music is intended to remind us of the sound of the Baroque, although it clearly does not fit the mold of the traditional Concerto Grosso that we discussed earlier. You can definitely hear several things in this work that remind you of Baroque music. The sound of the basso continuo with harpsichord and the use of a ritornello. Being a violinist, Zwillick was certainly familiar with Handel's sonatas for violin. She used the main melody of Handel's sonata in D major and created her own melody using the basic shape of Handel's tune. This becomes kind of a ritornello that is interrupted by literal quotations from Handel's sonata. It is an interesting concept and makes for an entertaining work. Listen at the Connect website.